Please remain standing as we hear the scripture for this morning. Uh, it is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. One of them didn't get up there, but here we go. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, says Paul, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. This is the Word of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. There was a golfer who was out on the golf course one day, and the guy was a real duffer, much worse than I am. I mean, well, there's a lot that fits into that category of duffer. Uh, this guy was bad. He'd swing eight or nine times before ever hitting the ball. And the golfer found his ball in the rough on one of the holes, and it had landed atop an anthill. Now, we know this is just a story because any of us, right, Ken, we just take it off that anthill, right? No, he, le he left it up there like, I, I don't know if you have to do that or not, but uh, he swung and he missed the ball, but he killed about a thousand ants. And he swung again and again, still missing the ball, but killing thousands and thousands more ants. And two ants came out of the hole just before the golfer's next swing. And the first ant said to the other, we better get on that ball or we're going to die. <coughs> How many times in your faith life that you have tried to deal with a particular sin or habitual sin, dysfunction in your life, have you just swung and swung only to stir things up and find yourselves defeated. This morning we're going to consider in the second part of this two-part message, we're going to talk about making a personal decision to work out our salvation, to be engaged in that process with hopes of victory over the effects of sin. And we do that by choosing not to accept sin in our lives in a day where it is very easily accepted. But we choose not to, even though God has wiped out the eternal consequence of sin, still, sin still has consequences lingering in, in, in the flesh. And, and uh, we as a community should be about trying to bring our lives in alignment with our spirit and the new creature we are in Christ. Not out of guilt, but because we love God and because we appreciate what is happening inside of us. Now, what's happening inside of us? I hope you experience conviction of sin. I hope you have a desire to do something about the things that you repeatedly do in your life that is not functional for you or for the community around you. Now, it's important that you experience that, uh, the movement of the Holy Spirit. John Wesley would call it a Christian conscience. Uh, but when we respond and strive in this way, Wesley would say that this is a confident assurance that the Holy Spirit, that Christ is present in our lives. And it gives us a, a confidence, an assurance that salvation is valid and real for us personally. But we need to do more than feel it. We really need to act on it. Again, not out of guilt, but for the sake of our families, for the sake of our children, for the sake of the community of faith, and definitely for the way people out there beyond these walls see us interacting with one another. In our scripture this morning, Paul is not telling the people that they are lacking in salvation or needing to do works in order to secure or hold on to that salvation. What he is telling them is that they have been justified by the blood of Christ. 
that their salvation is real and it's secure and nothing can take that away, that God has forgiven them of all their sin, but that is not a license to go and continue in sin. Just the opposite. We are, who are in Christ are new creatures in Christ. And in fact, we should be actively engaged in the process we talked about last week. Now some people walked out last week and said, Jerry, that was a little much. Well, are you aware that justification and sanctification are the two hinges upon which our door turns as United Methodists? These, the, the justifying grace and sanctifying grace are what we are about as Methodists. And that is that we recognize that God has justified us through the blood of Christ. Nothing that we do, it, it is a gift of grace, but at the same time we are very clear that because we are justified, we are saved for a reason. And that is to love God and love neighbor to bring our lives in as much alignment as possible. We even have what we call moving on to perfection. Did you know that as a clergy person, the bishop stands before us in front of 100,000 people? <laughs> That's what it feels like, not that many. At conference and asks us the question, do you plan to achieve perfection in this life? Do you know what we have to answer to that? Yes. And we mean perfection in spirit. But we also mean that we are going to battle sin from this moment on. That we seek to be the people that God has created us to be. So, we have on one hand justification and the, on the other sanctification. The part that God does is justification. When it says work out your salvation, which it says over and over in Scripture, go look at James. He doesn't say it that way, but faith without works is dead. We are responsible and should be accountable to never remain the same because God has changed us and is changing us. Take a look at Philippians chapter 3. I'm just looking, if you've got a Bible, look at it. It's a wonderful uh, bit of, of Scripture that you can see how, how Paul is, is working out of this justification and sanctification. Uh, verse 12 says, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In other words, what did Christ Jesus do? He, he justified me. He took hold of my life. He saved me eternally. But I press on to take hold of that even in my present experience. Does that make sense? Of course it should. Uh, look at verse 16. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Right? What have we already attained? Justification. Freedom from sin. Well, at least eternally. But sin still struggles in our flesh and, and is very much a, a present. We're free from the consequences of it eternally, but not the lingering uh, consequences of it in the flesh in this life. So as you decide to work out your salvation, I want to ask you two questions. What is the one particular sin, now someone misheard me on this on 830, they thought I was saying all their sin, and I said, Lord, that's infinite. You know, one, what is one particular sin that you, if you were going to enter into the process of sanctification, what would you choose to take on and how are you planning to do that? What is your plan of attack? Now, here are a few steps that I suggest if you're going to enter into this process of sanctification and begin trying to uh, wrangle that sin in your life. First, know who your enemy is. Know your enemy. My goodness, how can we take this on? This is serious stuff. You know it is. 
How are you going to deal? First, know your enemy. And let me tell you, the greatest enemy we have probably is us. Don't blame it all on the devil. You know, we are our own worst enemy. We can be our own enemy for the simple lack of motivation. Carrie doesn't want to hear this, but our bicycles that we bought together that are almost exactly alike, have the same number of gears, I think about 20,000 gears. There's so many gears. I, I've not even begun to use all the gears of my bicycle, only about three in the middle of one sprocket. Uh, but the same is true for you. You haven't even begun, I imagine, to use all the gears that God has equipped you with to deal spiritually with sin in your life. I heard a statement, and I had to work on it a little bit, but it, it's so true, that most of us prefer, actually prefer to endure the hell of a predictable situation rather than risk the potential joy of an unpredictable one. We'd rather just sit in our misery rather than take the risk of something that might be different that might bring greater joy uh, to our lives. I remember the last time we had an emphasis on our discipleship pathway. The number one thing I heard from people was this. I just don't have any sin really in my life. <laughs> Unbelievable. I heard it from groups. I heard it from individuals. Well, I just... You know, I, I really don't have any sin that, that, that I'm aware of. God help you. You know, I think, you know, if, to prove Satan is alive and well, if that's where you are, oh, oh, go talk to your spouse. <laughs> go talk to your children. If, if, if that's where you are. Talk to God about it. If that's where you are. Beyond ourselves, there's another enemy. Who is it that wants nothing more than to keep you dysfunctional, guilty, and ineffective? According to Scripture, his name is Satan. And he works in your life through principalities and powers. All of this is covered in our discipleship pathway. We would love for you to get involved in it. The publication that we use to get you started is called Minds on Fire because that's where Satan works mainly, is in your mind and the way you think. When you request a publication, your tendency is to say, give me one, I just want to read it. I'm not going to give it to you. I want you to be involved with either a coach, there she is right there, Phyllis, Dr. Phyllis Riney, or I want you to be involved in a small group when you get into this. Why? Because of my second suggestion. Do not endeavor to do this alone. You will be defeated. The process of sanctification should never be done in isolation. A great deal of prayer support must be behind you. Uh, you need to be engaged in community. Uh, my third suggestion is to establish a clear goal and strategy. Be very specific about your attack plan. My fourth suggestion is to seek wisdom. The woodpecker owes his success to the fact that he uses his head and he keeps pecking away until he finishes the job he started. Now I think that that's a good idea to hold on to as you're dealing with sin. It's much like an AA. I mean, it, it is that kind of thing. And I think we literally, I, I am dead serious. I think we ought to be honoring that and taking that seriously. You wouldn't have to tell us your sin, but just say, I'm dealing with something. And we give you little, little, uh, what are you, tokens for one week, two weeks, three weeks. That's what the body of Christ uh, should be about and, and taking seriously. Sin is powerful. And it has been hanging around in your flesh for a long time. And the conversion of a sinner often only takes a moment. While the growth and maturity of a saint takes an entire lifetime. 
One of the ways that Jesus brings about change, and this is, this is very uh, important to understand, and one of the reasons you just can't do it on your own, one of the ways Jesus brings about change in our lives is to give us wisdom about what that is that is driving us to that particular sin in the first place. What is it that's motivated us to sin that particular sin? If it's gluttony, then let me go with you and see, you probably go into a cafeteria or something where you see all that food lying out there. You know, what, what is it that motivates us? Is it depression? What is it? Determine what that is. Uh, for example, someone who has the sin uh, of a habit uh, of gambling. And by the way, now is a good time to have that one. Uh, the mega whatever, what is it? $1.6 billion. Buy it and tithe it. I bought one. Carrie and I bought one. Carrie and I have not never bought one before. I, I bought ten uh, uh, of those. And we decided, we prayed about it. We didn't win. But we did. We tried. But anyway, what about this gambling thing? Uh, let's take that as an example. What's driving me to gamble in the first place? You may have to go way back. You can't do this alone. Clearly it can be an addiction. And hear me. An addiction is not the sin. I mean, that's... That's what's happened over time, right? Uh, and, and that's enough to deal with in itself. But once you've done that, what is it that is causing that? Now, some of the most recent information on gambling is telling us that uh, the, the, the driving force for it is anxiety. I had never considered that. I, I, you know, I, I knew other reasons for it, but simple anxiety that causes us to go to gambling just trying to get our mind off uh, uh, of what, what is pressuring us at the time. So if we want to move past this habitual sin that enslaves us, we need to learn how to deal with anxiety issues and what life would be like if we could get past that. Because it's destroyed families. It has destroyed uh, the relationship between fathers and children. It has destroyed communities. Uh, Y'all must be doing a lot of gambling because we ain't getting enough money around here, you know? Maybe if I change things around. But no, seriously, it, it, uh, uh, we need to discern what is causing the issue in the first place. So if we want to get past this habitual sin that enslaves us, we need to take it very seriously. We need to prepare for it. We need to have prayer community behind us. We need to have a plan. And we would never get to the point we need to get by this. I've heard this over and over. Just stop it. Just, just, just stop doing that. It's going to happen. It's not going to happen. If we are in bondage to this sin, it has a hold on us and it's going to take major work to get it taken care of. What is the root issue? Discover that. Tell someone about it. Ask them to gracefully work with you through it. Listen, God has an impossibly high ability to forgive us. And that's a good thing. Because we have an impossibly high ability to stand in need of that forgiveness. Let me add this. The reason we need to work out our salvation is not primarily for our own happiness or victory, but rather for God's good pleasure. You remember that's what the Scripture says. God's pleasure. What pleases God? To love Him and what? Love your neighbor as yourself. If you are tied up and if you are dysfunctional, that is not going to help your neighbor, your family, or your children, or your church whatsoever. We do this for the sake of community. John Wesley and George Whitfield were both used of God to bring thousands of people to faith in Christ in the 18th century. 
Uh, the, Wesley is the founder of Methodism. Uh, he, he started us all. Uh, Whitfield was a good buddy of his. They were good friends, although they differed greatly on one thing, and that is the matter of God's power to offer grace to save us from sin versus humanity's responsibility to, to, to live into that new life we have in Christ, to work out our salvation. Wesley had such an emphasis on human responsibility that, that on his deathbed, he still doubted his salvation. Even though he had been pre preaching the gospel all these years, and he was this one who said that if you have a striving in you to, to, to please God, this is a, a sure indication of your salvation. Wesley struggled with this all his life. I, I can relate to that. I'm, I'm the one, the guilty one, always, always striving, and I hope not out of guilt, but out of the fact that I know I should bring my life in better alignment with the person I know I am in Christ. Well, a man was trying to uh, uh, find a juicy bit of gossip because, you know, old Whitfield, Whitfield... He was on the other side of all this and he just thought grace and grace all the more. He just basked in God's grace. He, did, he wasn't real concerned about dealing with sin. And this guy was trying to find this gossip and he once asked Whitfield if he thought he would see John Wesley in heaven. And Whitfield replied, no, I don't think I will. And the guy asking this question says, you've got to be kidding me. You're telling me after the greatest theologian and, and, and Christian disciple maker of all time, you're saying you don't think he's going to be in heaven? And Whitfield said, you didn't ask me if he's going to be in heaven. You asked if I was going to see him in heaven. And I, I said, no, because I don't believe I'll, I'll see Wesley because he's going to be so close to the throne of God. And I will be so far away that I won't even get a glimpse of him. Out of Wesley's life, dedicated to sanctification, came a people called Methodist. Do you get it? Method. Methodist. People who were committed to a process a method. Sunday school wasn't fellowship around donuts and can whatever, coffee. Fellowship was coming together in a small group, committed to, to profess your sin among friends and, and to share in holding one another up and, 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 and helping one another to be a, a person who is experiencing victory over sin for the sake of the people. Wesley was adamant about this is how we became Methodists, working out our salvation. Methodism was and could be again a movement of a people who were determined to establish a community-driven method of dealing with sin in the flesh that we may express our love of God and one another while building up our lives, our relationships in our church. A judge said to the defendant, Sir, you are a free man. And the court has dropped the charges against you of bigamy. Go on home to your wife. The defendant looked at him blankly and asked, Which one? <laughs> Dealing with the wrong and dysfunction in our life is terribly difficult. Sanctification is a complex and difficult lifestyle. God has freed us from the eternal death that we all uh, don't want to see or look forward to. He, we are free from that, uh, that. That comes about due to sin in our lives. But it is clear that secure in that promise of grace God takes up residence within us that we may be encouraged and convicted and empowered to work 
out our salvation. That's why I call it a workout plan. You work out of your position of salvation. Your assurance of you work out of that confidence. The salvation that is yours. That we may know victory over sin. At least pick out one. You're never going to figure out all of them. But what is the one that you struggle with and it's hurting your family and your children and your church and your community? What is it? Victory over sin. Even today. Amen.